Welcome to Church Online. It's such a joy and a privilege that we all get to worship God together. Even as you're seated at your homes or probably you're traveling uh, or you're in the midst of some important work and yes, you've tuned in to watch the service. I just want to encourage you, even before we get into a time of worship, our worship team is prepared to lead us into a time where we get to worship God and be strengthened uh, by His presence. But before that, I just want to draw our attention to Psalm 107 verses 13 onwards. And this is what it says, Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and He saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness, the utter darkness, and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for His unfailing love and His wonderful deeds for mankind. For He breaks down gates of bronze and cuts through bars of iron. And even right now, before we get into a time of worship, I just want to encourage you. If you're struggling with something, something that you're embarrassed to talk about, struggling with something that you're, you've been constantly going back to it, and there's a cycle of guilt and shame, and probably that cycle has become such a stronghold over you. Remember, as we read this, God is able to break through everything, which requires us to give thanks to Him first, to say, God, you are God over my life. This particular addiction, this particular problem, this particular sickness is not God over me. And I want to encourage you, whatever you're going through, we have a God who's broken everything. That's the power of the cross, that when we look at the cross, we see Satan's place changed entirely. He's not seated above us. It's God who's seated above us. And I want to encourage you, would you look to Him? The power of the cross will be evident when we look to the cross and when we pray to the God of all creation. The person who hung on the cross on our behalf, who redeemed us once and for all, and on the third day who rose again, because that resurrection power is alive in us today. So church, I would encourage you, even as our worship team leads us into a time of worship, may we seek Him. And as an act of surrender, can we just lift our hands and say, Lord, I'm here to surrender everything to you, so that you will be glorified, you will be honored. You, Lord Jesus, will be able to come through into my life and break every chain, set me free, so I can worship you for who you are, with all that I have. So church, let's worship God together. There's absolutely no other name other than Jesus who deserves all our praise. It says, the Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And today, if you and I are breathing, let's choose to praise Him. Let's choose to lift His name and say, there's no rock. There is no rock in which I can build. My, my foundation is on you, Lord Jesus. Can we come before Him and tell Him and sing this song. <clears throat> there is no rock, there is no God like our God. No other name worthy of all our praise. The rock of salvation that cannot be moved is proven Himself to be faithful and true there is no rock there is no god like us there's no rock there is no rock there is no god like our god no 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 other name worthy of all our praise the rock of salvation that cannot be to be faithful and true 
Jesus, who is our firm foundation. And he 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 doesn't he, his he, he doesn't mix words. He when he speaks, he speaks with clarity. When he speaks, he speaks into our life. It with the very situation that we face, he's so present. He's so uh, in the moment. He's not just the guard of Abraham and Moses and Isaac that you read in the Bible. He's still working. He's still in the work of doing miracles. He's still the God of everyone here. He's still the God of you who's listening to. And if you're wondering, oh, there's so much. I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed with everything that's happening around. Can I invite you to just quiet in the things that's burdening us and can we focus on him and choose to bless his name choose to bless his name because bible says blessed are those who run to him where do we run when we need something where do we go when we want to share something he is present he is there in the very living room where you are let's choose to bless his name Blessed are those who run to me, who place their hope and confidence in Jesus. He won't forsake them. Blessed are those who seek His face, who bend their knee and fix their gaze on Jesus. They won't be shamed.
something in your life. Bless God in the sanctuary. Bless God, fields of plenty. Bless God in the darkest valley. Every chance I get, I'll bless your name. Bless God with my hands. Bless God with the praise that cost me. Bless God when nobody's watching. Every chance I get, I'll bless your name. Bless God when the weapons fall me. Bless God when the thoughts Bless God for He goes before me.
everything tell him Lord you're worthy Lord Jesus you're worthy of every every thing that I hold close and dear you're worthy Lord Father you're worthy you're worthy Lord may day in and day out may your incense arise Lord Father Wherever we go, Lord Father, may we be carriers of your presence, Lord Jesus. Would you sanctify us one more time, cleanse us one more time, Lord Father. Dwell among us, dwell in us, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day. Lord, Lord, even as we pray right now, Lord Jesus, as a church, we just lift our hands, Lord, and we say, thank you for going before us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for finishing the work. And even as you've given us the mantle to take your word into this world, Lord, I pray as we live out uh, as light, houses, Lord, in different parts of the world, in different cities, in different parts of our own city of Chennai, Lord, I pray that you'd give us a great strength and mercy right now, Lord. I pray even right now, Lord, for all those who are struggling, Lord Jesus, Lord, with ill health, that you would be the God of healing right now for them. For those who are struggling because of certain issues that have cropped up, Lord, that you would deliver them, Lord Jesus. I pray for those who are seeking for favor, Lord, especially in their work, in their work circumstances, and it's not changing. I pray, would you go before them and give them the necessary uh, breakthrough that they need, Lord Jesus. We ask that you would come down, Lord Jesus. Come down as your people call, Lord. We pray, Lord, even as a country, Lord, we ask for your peace to come down upon us, Lord, as cities and places are going into monsoon season and we are he hearing and seeing a lot of flooding and all that happen. Protect your people, Lord. I pray especially, Lord, for those uh, incidences that we keep hearing on the news, Lord. Your peace would prevail, Lord. I pray humanity will come to a place of, Lord, looking at others, Lord Jesus, and respecting, Lord Jesus, and honoring and having a deep love for mankind, Lord Jesus, which is beyond color, which is beyond caste, which is beyond race, Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We pray especially, Lord, for the attacks that are happening right now, Lord Jesus, in Israel, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, Ukraine, Russia, Lord Jesus, and all the various civil wars that we keep hearing about. We pray for each and every leader. You, can, you who move the heart of Pharaoh can move their hearts, Lord. Would you come into their lives? Would you do great and wonderful things, Lord? I pray especially right now, Lord, that your hand be upon each and every church leader, each and every person, Lord Jesus, who's doing your work. I pray especially, Lord, for all those who participate 
participated, Lord Jesus, in the Luzon Congress, as they go back, Lord, today, as they go back to their churches and their ministries, Lord, that they'll be envisioned to do greater things, Lord. And we as a church, Lord, will be carriers of your light. I pray especially that we won't shy away from doing what you've called us to do, Lord. I pray your plan, purpose, and will will be so evident in our life that we'll know why you've created us, Lord Jesus, what you've called us to do, and that we'll plug ourselves in, Lord, and do that specific part that you've called us to do, Lord, in gratefulness in lord uh being clear lord jesus so that we won't be people lord jesus who'll just be lord aimlessly living in this world but as paul said that we'll be intentional lord we'll be intentional i pray especially right now lord for families who are struggling lord jesus who've been long asking for a breakthrough and in as they're in that wait that you would strengthen them in their wait lord jesus we believe breakthroughs will come at your appointed time lord because we we'll know how to handle the breakthrough and i pray that lord we will live by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony i pray for those who've received miracles who've received deliverance who've received your power lord jesus and has seen the miraculous work that they will testify about it lord that it will encourage not just us but everyone around lord go before us strengthen us be with us lord jesus i pray even as we hear your word as we go into the third part of this kingdom life we'll be strengthened in your most holy name we pray amen amen so church even as we listen to the third part of this kingdom life i pray that you'll be encouraged don't be disheartened god thinking that this kingdom life is hard but remember the god of angel armies is with us and he wants us to pursue him he wants us to live it out here in this world so I encourage you that even as you hear God's word, let his word work in and through you. Permeate so it will change you inside out. So let's listen to God's word right now. The life that Jesus lived when on earth looked easy but needed sacrifice and a dying to self. Daily it was a distinctly different life from what we know because it put God first and others next. It required internalizing his word so that it just permeated through. It expected the impossible to happen anytime. Today, we can live that life with God in us and with us through his spirit. This life is hinged on the finished work of Jesus on that cross. We now have access to his healing, restoration, power and authority. Will you come join us as we learn to live the kingdom life? Hi Church, what a pleasure it is to share the word with you today. We're looking at the kingdom life part three. Um, we looked last week at how um, we undergo this crushing in order to produce new wine. And this new life entails the new wine, the anointing that is fresh for this season. And today we're going to be going into discord. Um, the difference when the outside and the inside don't match up. That's what I've titled today's sermon. Um, you know, a lot of times we we speak a lot of Christianese. We do the things that people at church would recommend or do or, or live by. But deep within, there's a dissonance. There's something that's keeping us from actually living out what we believe or living out what we proclaim. And I believe that's what Jesus was talking about when he spoke in Mark chapter 7. So that's the base verse for this um, week. As we get into that passage, I just read this story about um, a zookeeper. And he had a full zoo. And one day, um, the gorilla unfortunately died because it was a peak summer that year and the gorilla didn't make it. So he decided he can't afford to have the gorilla cage empty because that was a huge um, source of entertainment for the little kids who came during their summer holidays. So what he did was he got a huge gorilla costume and he hired a guy to wear it and sit in the particular enclosure which was meant for the gorillas. And so on the first day, this guy who has been hired, he has no clue how to act like a gorilla, wears the costume and goes and sits in the cage. And um, the, the zookeeper told him, you know, do some antiques, keep the kids entertained and stuff. So he was trying his best, jumping around in that costume and trying to do funny things just for the viewing public when he tripped over a low wall and fell into the lion enclosure. And once he realized where he was at, he started freaking out, screaming and saying, oh my God, help me, help me, I'm going to die. Um, and it was funny because the lion came close to him and bent down to his ear and said, dude, stop it. We're both going to lo lose our jobs if you don't stop it. Um, and too many of us 
are like these two men hidden in costumes. Too many of us believers are living this double life. We look like one thing, we say another thing, we pretend to be practicing something, but our private lives are completely different. And I believe God is calling the hypocrites home. God is calling all of us who are having a mask or a costume to cover up what really lies beneath. And as I was preparing, this was such a convicting time for me because all of us, without exception, have those facets of our life which are very hypocritical. And those of us who have children, our kids expose it very fast. You know, they say, oh, but you said that then, but why are you not doing that now? And God is calling us to a place of deep honesty, of dropping the mask, dropping the costume and coming as we are to him. Because only God can set us free. It is not by power, not by might, but by my Holy Spirit, says the Lord. This is not something by willpower or by just, you know, just being very conscious. We're going to change it. These are deeply um, inbred attitudes and motives and agendas that only the Spirit of God can reveal and the blood of Jesus can heal. And so as we get into this word, I just pray that you will be able to resonate with what Jesus is talking about. Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to 7. It says, The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tra tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. What is Jesus talking about? Is he anti-hygiene? No. That's not what Jesus is talking about. It really boils down to what the Pharisees thought they were accomplishing every time they washed their hands. We've just come out of a huge pandemic and we know that all healthcare providers told us that we need to wash our hands because the, the virus most often transmits through our, the bacteria on our hands. And what happened as a result was people washed their hands too much that the good bacteria from the hands disappeared as well. What Jesus is talking about is not about saying, you know, avoid hygiene. That's not what he's saying. These Pharisees thought that if they ate with unwashed hands, that they were contaminating their inner being. They thought that by washing it, they were purifying their hearts. They were purifying their minds. They thought that they were standing pure before their Yahweh God. But here Jesus is coming and saying, I don't care about the outward cleanliness. I care about what's inside. And they were actually addressing Jesus's disciples' behavior where they just came and sat and started eating. He said, this is not important. And then he talks about what Isaiah wrote about them. Isaiah wrote about the people of Israel being so stubborn and hard, hard-hearted and, and, and strong-willed about drawing close to God. He said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Can I ask you this question? When you stand to worship at church or when you're worshiping alone with your headphones, you're walking outside, you're in the gym, is your heart far from God or is it in touch with God? Because the truth is too many of us have created this, this very curated form of our belief system. We know what to say, when to say it, how to say it. We know how to address our pastor and then we know how to address the person on the street. We know how to behave on the outside, but privately no one knows, but you know. And God is saying, I'm coming back here with this proposition. Instead of wiping and washing your hands to exhaustion, why not just come to me, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you? Jesus was the fulfillment of that. And Mark 7 verse 15 is pivotal to understanding what this whole theme was. Jesus is then asked by his disciples. Disciples are like us, they're a bit slow. So they come to the room with him and they ask him, what did you mean that what we consume doesn't defile us? Because these were people who followed kosher. What they ate, they had a series of animals they shouldn't eat and a couple that they could. So he's saying, they're asking him, what do you mean? And this is what Jesus says, verse 15. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. So often we as Christians have told in our youth groups, you know, careful what you consume, careful what you put in. And it doesn't change that because the, the Apostle Paul writes, 
everything is permissible but not everything is beneficial so we need to put a guardrail right there but suppose you don't put a guardrail because you just feel i don't want to be so legalistic about it i think i have the freedom say you have that mindset that's also okay but what you allow in changes to something that starts coming out of you it starts to exude from you and what it what comes out of you is what matters is what jesus is saying because out of the depths of the heart the mouth speaks what is in our heart comes out in our speech in our attitude in our demeanor all of it and so it's so important to understand that it is not what we consume that defiles us it is what we produce a good tree produces good fruit a bad tree produces bad fruit is that simple according to people today we have so much research on microplastics on how they are harming us because for years we have been using plastics at home and everybody says that we probably have a lot of plastic accumulated in our bodies eating from aluminum aluminum vessels probably have also contaminated us there's probably metals heavy metals that have been in different products we've had over the years but jesus is saying while those things are different what you have consumed saying you know this is precious this is pure i will wash this this in this way and this tradition and this ritual he says following all of that is no use if your heart is far from me it is no use if you don't control what comes out of your being and so the problem is too many of us today are very content with washing the superficial you see a photographer now when they take a picture of us what do they do the first thing they do is touch us up they change our complexion they remove all the flaws they they alter things recently one of our photographer friends was saying that a person who came for a shoot didn't have shoes on she just was you know just flip flops so he needed shoes for the shoot so he made her remove her footwear and he just photoshopped shoes on he used ai and he just photoshopped it this is the world we live in we are so capable of altering what is on the outside the number of botched facial cosmetic surgeries have increased because ordinary people people with practically normal there's been no accident none of that but they walked into a surgery thinking they need to look better and it went downhill but god is saying i don't care about the superficial i care about the heart i care for from it issues the deeper things of life and so today we i want to ask you before we actually get into the crux of what it looks like to be a walking talking hypocrite we're first going to look at two two things that we do as ordinary people when we talk about cleansing ourselves we may not do what the pharisees did washing ourselves thoroughly um, but we do two other things one is we water down the scriptures i see this increasingly in in com- in, uh, in today's times where people look at the scripture and say oh well i don't want the old testament that doesn't help me i'll just read this if i'm going to read from the old testament i'll just read psalms and proverbs the 66 books of the canon are so powerful because they were written by so many different authors and yet they just fit they are in line and the story of jesus is is literally the thread that carries it all the gospel is held in all 66 books and it's so important that we don't water down the scriptures the problem is when we water down the scripture we tame the scripture for my benefit we we make it applicable for myself and so what i do is i diminish my sinfulness i increase someone else's sinfulness where does grace go the beauty of the scripture is it reveals my hidden flaws it reveals my blind spots i cannot read it and say i'm going to read it today and find a verse that causes me to believe that my husband is a bigger sinner than me that's not what the scripture is i cannot water down the scriptures to satisfy my needs that's one of the things we do we may not wash our hands 200 times a day but we may be watering down the scripture to meet our personal selfish needs if you notice the pharisees they were not actually teaching the torah per se they had a a book where in which were written all the traditions of the elders traditions that were marked down thousands of years that leaders had actually written down and these guys were taking that and teaching it to the people like it was the word of god and it wasn't it was just traditions it was rituals and a lot of times we may not do that but we might turn a scripture a little bit to meet our fancy we may look at a particular scripture and say well that doesn't apply to me my situation is different and i would urge you that you stop watering down the scriptures we cannot change the meaning of the original scripture let god reveal it to you as is because it's powerful as a it's the rema word it's the revealed word it is so powerful to our very being 
Second thing that we often do is we eye wash. We do an eye wash of it. What does that look like? What is eye wash? You know, when something goes into your eye, you don't rush to the hospital immediately. Okay, what you do is, and this is a, something an eye doctor once taught me. She said, you just take, you know, a little bit of water in the palm of your hand, put it in and you blink into it. Now, is this bath level quality of washing? No. But that is all it needs to cleanse the eye, the outer surface of the eye. And I've tried it many times and it's worked. But the problem is a lot of us think that when I do an eye wash kind of cleansing, a very superficial thing, then I'm sorted. A lot of us say sorry to people on social media. They're the very people we tone down on social media. Then we try to do it, just do the cover up by apologizing on a status. Some of us have broken up on a message and done with it. We think, you know what, I'm clear. My conscience is clear. Have you gone deeper? Did you go before God, sit with him and repent? What has happened to us that we think we can bypass personal confession and repentance to God before we actually access our promises or our blessings? God is calling us to a deeper wash. He's asking for a wash in the spirit realm. The eye wash is not enough. It's not enough. Too many of us are relying on our own capacity to be articulate, to just say the right thing at the right time and I'm done. Maybe you've just been singing a song or two in worship. You lift your hands and you say, God, I'm clean with you. But have you gone deeper? Have you allowed the Holy Spirit to wash you deeper? Only His blood can cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not our well-placed words, not our understanding of the Bible, but a heart that is penitent. I love Psalm 51 because David had to go deep. He had committed a grave sin. And he didn't do an eye wash of it of just saying publicly, you know what, this is what I've done. I'm so sorry. Here's recompense for Bathsheba. Um, you know, and say sorry to Joab for what happened to Uriah. He went deep with God. So today I'm asking you, did you go deep with God when you needed to come clean about something? Or was it just eye wash? Was it just superficial? The, the Pharisees had this understanding that they washed the vessels, the pitchers. In certain translations, it actually talked about cleaning the dining couch, the one that they reclined on. Look at the depths of, of ritualistic stuff that they were up to. They needed to do this to feel pure before they sat down for the next meal. And when you think about it, sometimes we all we care in terms of settling something with God even is just keeping it at the surface level. And we also sometimes explain it away to God. Lord, but you know how they are. I've done this. But you know how they are. There's no point of this conversation. And God is saying, you come clean with me first. Stop doing this, I wash. Tell it to me like it is. The problem that when we resort to doing this is we minimize our sin. We dismiss our need for God's help. Because without God's help, sanctif sanctification is not going to happen. We're not going to be purified. I need God's help on a daily basis to sanctify me, and also to show grace to others in their missteps. What happens is when I minimize my sin, I maximize theirs. And God is calling us today into a deeper place of authenticity, of dropping the facade. He's saying what you are behind closed doors and what you are outside need to match. For the Christian to have authority in the things we speak, for the Christian to have impact in the real world, we cannot afford to have this huge gap between private and public. So I want to ask you, have you been covering up the deeper sins of your life by just fixating on the superficial? Jesus always went deeper. He was never content with the superficial. So why should we? Mark 17 verses 17 to 23 says this, After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit. Lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. The Apostle Paul, you know, he, he kind of expands on this. He talks about how one person eats a food 
and then that becomes a stumbling block to someone else. So he concludes from Romans 14 verse 17 saying, The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Continues, because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Wow. What does this mean? So Jesus says, it's not what goes in that corrupts you. So food is all clean. He said, there's no longer this kosher, non-kosher. He says, all of it I have cleansed by my blood. But now he's saying, the stuff that comes out of us, that is what defiles us. And what are the different things he mentions? These I want us, we will look at them closer later. But he mentions about 10 different things that corrupt every one of us. So all of us on some level are defiled. Not just by the microplastics and the non-organic food you're consuming. You are actually defiled. I am actually defiled by these things that dwell deep inside me. And I thank God for the Holy Spirit who works on a daily basis till I will reach eternity to clean me up. It's not a one-day thing. It's not a one-month thing. It's not a one-year thing. It's lifelong. But Paul expands to tell us, those who want to serve Christ in this way, that is actually pursuing righteousness, love, peace and joy, they are pleasing to God and receive human approval. Now I want us to just look at this, receive human approval. What is this? We're, we're not meant to be people pleasers. We're not meant to uh, make others happy. We're, we're made to revel in our relationship with God and also to bless others. Am I right? What does this mean? What is he actually talking about? And I believe Paul is talking to the Roman church and he's saying that when you are fixated on what you're eating or drinking, the superficial stuff that feeds our flesh, you, you are not feeding the spirit. But the kingdom of God is all about the spirit. And that is where you have this right standing with God. You exhibit a shalom peace. You have joy beyond your circumstances. Those are the things which please God and doesn't end there. It gets the approval of man. What are we talking about when we talk about approval? I believe it basically means we are not a stench in the, in the lives of people around us. Hypocrisy is the single biggest reason why many people either leave Christendom or because of which people avoid us. Oh, she says one thing, but she does another. Oh, she claims to stand for this, but her private life doesn't seem that way. I've seen how he leads his home. There's something different about someone who actually looks after their family and someone like him. Something doesn't add up. Christians everywhere, we need to understand that the biggest stench causers is hypocrisy. The biggest stench causer in our lives is hypocrisy. We say one thing, we do another. We project ourselves in a certain way, but are very different in reality. We use verses on our social media status, but our lives don't live out the gospel. What is the point? If we want to receive human approval, which is not people pleasing, which is not playing to the band, but rather living in such a way that we are a magnet for Jesus, living in such a way that we are truly the salt and the light. If the salt is spoiled, the food is messed up. If there is no light in the different parts of the world that we're all placed in, darkness prevails. We are the light. And the reason, number one reason our light is dimmed is because of our hypocrisy. The reason, number one reason our saltiness is put down is because of our hypocrisy. Luke chapter 11 verses 39 to 52. I'm just going to go verse by verse in this to understand in, in you know, it's literally live action. What is hypocrisy today? It's exactly what Jesus de described back in the day and it matches with who we are today. So we're going to read a couple of verses together and then I'm just going to exp expound it a bit. Okay. Luke 11, starting from verse 39, it says, Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside made the inside also? Now as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. So the first mark of hypocrisy is where you are holy for the show of it. You're all about, you know, how you carry yourself. But inwardly, you're not actually living in a way that pleases God. You pretend to be generous, but you withhold from those who need it the most. And so Jesus is very clear. He tells them, you just be generous, then you're cleansed. For how many of us, we pretend to live a life that is for others, but we're deeply clenching our fists. We are misers. We don't want to give off what we have. We say we worked hard for it. This is mine. God is calling that out today. Verse 42, this is what it says. Woe to you Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue and all other kinds of garden herbs. 
but you neglect justice and the love of God, you should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. It's interesting because Jesus is addressing this problem that a lot of us have where we pick and choose the scriptures we want to live by. We abandon the controversial or the hard to follow stuff. We miss the heart behind the scripture and we choose to look at it legalistically. I will tithe 10%. But when we come to the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, what does it say? It says everything you have is, is God's. Give generously. Those who sow generously reap generously. There's no mention of 10% in the New Testament. You see what I'm saying? We can become so picky and choosy about what we buy into from the scripture and what we reject. What is God asking of you today? He says, maybe you're giving it very, you know, axiomatically, you just give month on month. But I notice that you don't give off your time. I notice that you don't spend time with your family. Or maybe you're so caught up in self-care that you're not worried about the other things I'm calling you into. What is God calling you into? Third part, verse 43. Woe to you Pharisees because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Another form of our hypocrisy is pretending to be humble. Oh, I don't need that prominent space. I don't need that mention. Oh, yeah, I did help in that video. It's fine. I don't need the mention. But you go all around town saying how you didn't get mentioned. It's a false humility. You need appreciation and validation from people. Remember what Jesus said. He said he never entrusted. It, it says Jesus never entrusted himself to people for he knew what they were made of. He only looked to God, his father, for glory. And yet, the hip hypocrisy in us causes us to act humble when we're desperate for elevation, we're desperate for validation. Verse 42, 44, it says, Woe to you because you are like unmarked graves which people walk over without knowing it. When you read it in the message version, it's just such a disturbing verse. It says, they walk over you not knowing that there is decay of old bones beneath the surface. And what is this talking about? You know, a lot of, lot of us as Christians can paint this picture of perfection, of purity, of holiness. But deep inside us, there's this skeleton. And it's, it's not just a skeleton because we all have a skeleton. But this is like a, a cupboard full of skeletons. Skeletons in our closet galore. And the beauty is, you know, the, the fact is we have a God who knows about our skeletons. And the quicker we come to this realization of opening that skeleton closet and saying, Lord, cleanse this off me, he does it. But too many of us are so ashamed of it. We know that if it gets dug up, it's going to harm our identity, our, our, our reputation. We keep it hidden. And unfortunately, we are influencing others maybe through social media, through personal relationship, through being their superior at work or whatever. They are unintentionally engaging with someone who is fully decayed from the inside. It's like a rotten apple at the core. The outside looks perfect. But the deeper you go, you see that such darkness exists that it's scary. How many of us can fit into that? Verse 45, one of the experts in the law answered him, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. Jesus replied, And you experts in the law, woe to you because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Are you a teacher? Are you a Bible study leader? Are you a pastor? Are you an evangelist? Are you someone who is prophetic? What load have you put on someone else? In the name of your authority, in the name of them needing to submit to authority, what have you put on them? Have you told them they can't do this, this, this? When Jesus is all about freedom, Jesus says, I'll bring the conviction. You just lead them by example. I love what Paul writes to Timothy. He says, you lead by example, Timothy. With your speech, your love, your purity. And a lot of times I'm finding it's tempting to put a double standard to our leadership. I'll do this, but you can't do this. I can do this because I'm mature. But you being immature, you can't do this. And I believe God is calling that out. He's saying when you impose that rule, walk with them, pray with them, invest in them. Otherwise, don't lay that burden on them. You encouraging someone to live a celibate life? Have you thought that through? Have you understood what it requires of you to journey with them? Because it will be a very lonely road. It's a very lonely road. Will we do with others? Will we spend time with them? Will we give off ourselves? especially when we're in a position of leadership, to walk with them, to encourage them, to take the phone anytime and say, I know you're struggling, I'm with you, I'm praying for you. Too many times we have put a load on a person that has been mentored by us, 
I'm being led by us and we've said, do this. It's good for you. It's what I feel you should do. God told me to do it. We bring all that in and we don't step into journey with them. God's calling us out. Verse 47, woe to you because you built tombs for the prophets and it was your ancestors who killed them. So you testify that you approve of what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets and you built their tombs. Because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Now, we have to understand that new covenant, all generation curses are broken. We are not going to be punished for what our ancestors did. But the fine print there is if we are repeating the sins of the ancestors, we will be held responsible for that. Each generation is responsible for what they do. And here... He's talking about how these guys were building tombs for the people, the, the ancestors, that the, the prophets and priests that their ancestors killed. So he's saying basically you're admitting that you killed them and you're doing some sort of penance for it. And he says, therefore, I blame you. I believe God is calling the hypocrisy out of our own lives at this moment. And he's saying there are some sins of your ancestors which reek up to high heavens and it stops with you. It has to stop with you. You are continuing it saying, this is who I am. I'm genetically predisposed to alcoholism. You have a bunch of different ideas. Oh, this is how my ancestors were. This is what they did. They ran a quarry. They did stuff that was unjust with, with their workers. So why not? It worked for them. God is saying it ends with you. If you know me, if you know my word, it will end with you. You will repent and turn and go the direction I'm telling you to go in. It's on us as to what we choose to repeat of our ancestors. If there's good things from your ancestors, please, please, like we talked about digging old wells, if it's prayer, if it's fasting, if it's giving of yourself to the poor, whatever it is, do that. But what in your genealogy, what in your family line needs to end? You need to identify it. What are you repeating unconsciously or consciously? Oh, my father hit me, therefore I can hit my kid. It has to end somewhere for the sake of generations to come. It ends with you. Oh, my, my parents were unfaithful to each other. So it's okay how I live. It doesn't matter anyway. This is what's going to happen. This is my lot. I beg to differ. Our lot in Jesus is different. We live under the new covenant. We live by his grace every day. He will give us that which we need for life and godliness. So what is our excuse? Finally, verse 52. Woe to you experts in the law because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered and have hindered those who are entering. Many times the rules we set for ourselves and for others are stumbling blocks. You know, I can be a stumbling block not just to myself, to my children, to my spouse, to those who are in my life. And here he's saying these experts, they had the key, they knew what they must do, they were not doing it. And because they were not doing it, all their followers were also not doing it. So they didn't allow themselves to experience the joys of eternal life by believing in Jesus. And they set back an entire group because of their stubbornness. And I want to ask us today, have we been doing the same thing? We know the good we must do, but we don't do it. And that's a sin in the eyes of God. We know the good we're supposed to do. We're stepping away from it saying it's too hard. And because you have modeled that life, generations after you are going to do the same thing. And God is saying, the hypocritical Christian is a surefire way of preventing others from entering the kingdom of God, preventing others from knowing Jesus. The simplest example was what Mahatma Gandhi said when he saw apartheid so close up, when he saw the, the gaps between the white Christians and the African Christians, he said, I love the songs the Christians sing, but I don't think I'll ever become one, just because of the people I've seen. In all probability, he loved Jesus as well. But it's hard to enter the kingdom of God when you see fellow followers of Jesus behaving the way they like, behaving in such a detrimental way to the gospel, behaving in such a way where there's no limits on their life to the bad they will do, Be behaving in a way where there's no discipline, where there is no possibility for course correction because they're so far off. Who are you preventing from entering the kingdom of God? 
who are you dissuading because of your behavior because of the kind of leadership skills you are displaying because of the way you behave with co-workers how many people are turning away from jesus because of the way you and i behave this is a call out for all of us so what does this kingdom life require us to do it requires us to mean what we say and say what we mean stop talking in riddles stop saying stuff like i can get this done you know any time in the next within the next fortnight give a date stick to the date tell that person you're pursuing what your intentions are don't be in the gray don't keep them guessing mean what you say and say what you mean keep to your word jesus said let your yes be yes and your no be no meaning that should carry so much weight it's for the follower of jesus when i say yes i'll be there it means i'll be there yes i will do it it means i will do it i don't have to say i swear or this and that i should be so credible as a witness in the marketplace that they will say when christine says it when christine says it christine will do it you need to walk the talk you can be talking all the live long day about jesus about his word you can share the verse of the day on your whatsapp story but if you are living however you like with absolutely no guardrails behaving in any old way texting whatever you like you are you fall under the category of the hypocrite you will be a deterrent to people knowing christ you have to lead yourself as you lead others especially for those of us who are in leadership positions for mentors who are parents if we don't lead ourselves wisely we don't need to learn we need to learn to regulate ourselves before we expect regulation from others we need to pursue excellence and diligence before we expect it of others we need to go deeper with ourselves so that we can see our own sinfulness before we point out someone else's i personally love marriage just for that because you know when we're thinking of what someone else has done to us it just needs one word from our spouse to bring us back into track and say but we are not any better we say the same things we have the same prejudice and it's quick it brings us back in shape it alerts us to our own hypocrisy go deeper with yourself find out what that plank is in your life and identify it and pull it out because it doesn't help when we only look at others sinfulness and not ours and i love that jesus was very clear about how he felt about the pharisees these were men created in his image and yet he was very tough on them this is what he said in matthew 12 33 he said make a tree good and its fruit will be good or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad for a tree is recognized by its fruit you brood of vipers how can you who are evil say anything good for the the mouth speaks what the heart is full of a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him it's interesting because the pharisees didn't know how much they needed jesus purely because they denied who they were they put up a big show they walked in such in in such authority and influence they thought they were sorted with god they thought that their heart was in a good place they had no clue how far away they were they had no clue that the source of salvation was in front of them but they were still doing things to achieve salvation and so this denial of who they were and how much they actually needed him was the cause of all of this hypocrisy and jesus hated how hated how the pharisees behaved when they would come there just to needle him the way they spoke he would say i know what you're thinking why are you thinking such evil thoughts he knew everything before they opened their mouth and yet he would allow them to talk i think for our benefit for us to understand this is where i see myself lord this is who i am How many of us can honestly say Lord I'm sick and I'm in need of the great physician How many of us can say Lord my mind is twisted I need you to uncoil it Lord my spirit is broken because of what I have walked through and I'm starting to break others because of it Can you fix me Jesus said this in Luke 5 verse 31 he said And Jesus replied to them it is not those who are healthy who need a physician but only those who are sick I did not come to call the self proclaimed righteous who see no need to repent but sinners to repentance to change their old way of thinking to turn from sin and to seek God and his righteousness As I was preparing this I realized that it's one thing to say Lord I'm a hypocrite but it's another to repent and say i'm so sorry lord because i have put loads on people that i should not have put i turned away people when they displayed sin that was mirrored in me 
when we come clean with God, it just radically changes the equation. Because Jesus sees the deepest parts of our hearts. You and I can whitewash our speech. We can, you know, cover our behavior for a while. But sorry to say, before long, everything gets exposed. Our genuine nature comes to the surface. Our inner junk will come out if we don't let it all out before the master, before our maker, before our savior, before our redeemer, before our restorer. He is the one who makes all things right. He makes all things new. Too many of us have been living double lives. You're wondering why your breakthrough isn't coming. But God is saying, look at the double life that you are living. I cannot bless someone who has a blatant double life. Even if it's a very hidden double life, he cannot. It's more like what happened at the Battle of Jericho. After the, the big victory, they're so confident. And they decide to go and conquer this little town called Ai. And they just decide to take a few guys. But because there was sin in the camp after Jericho, they couldn't win that small little war battle they had to get into. Too many of us are facing so many battles, we know we like to call it the devil's attacking us. But what if you're so discordant that you can't even detect anymore that you're not just fighting demons, you're fighting demons of your own making. Your double life is blocking your blessing. Maybe you're a spouse and you look and sound perfect. You look in church, put together, you put your arm around your spouse. Everything looks fine and dandy. But privately, only God sees the abuse you meet out to them. And he's saying his time's running out. The hypocrites need to come home. Their father waits. He is willing, if you repent, to embrace you and start you on a new journey. But it's on you. Some of you come to church, you talk to everyone, but you have private habits that are, yet you're grappling with. You're not coming clean to God about some of you have already broken your marital vows or you're on the verge of it. And God is reaching out. He's saying, enough. You're tired from the double life. Come to me. Some of you say you love people. You care for them. But actually, deep inside, you're cold-hearted. You don't care for anyone. Some of you claim to love serving. But you'll only serve for your benefit. You will only serve if your agenda is met. And God is saying, that's not true. Come clean. Come clean. You claim that you don't have prejudice. You love all. Like Jesus says, you know, Jesus loves the little children of the whole world. You say, you know what? You love everybody. But you have dark prejudices deep within you. And you know it. You quote scripture like a boss. You know the word inside out. Because you've been in Sunday school from, you know, the beginner stage. But your private life is a mess because you have not drawn near to God with your heart. Your mouth worships him. You may be in the worship team. You may be a music musician. You may be a worship leader. You may even be a leader. But you know you have private strongholds that you're battling day in, day out. Some of them you've even given into. You said, this is how I am. I can't change. But God is saying, don't defile the anointing that is in you. Come clean so that I can take you to the next level and use you to bless more. But you need to come clean. God's calling the hypocrites home. He understands the struggle, but he is now offering grace to us. The condition, condition is this. Washing hands won't do it. I need to wash my heart. My heart. I need to rend my heart. That's what the psalmist would say. Rending is just shedding, shredding it, pulling it apart and saying, God, this is the most broken part of me. I can explain away this sin to people, but I can't explain it away to you, God. I abused because I was abused. I molest because I was molested. But God is saying enough with the excuses. Drop the costume. Drop the facade. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to turn you inside out and cleanse you. So as we close, this is what I want to do with you. I'm going to go back to that passage we were reading, Luke chapter 7. And I'm going to be reading 21 and 22, the verses 21 and 22. And I'm going to read those words with very slow intention with the intention to actually bring our attention to each of these sins that Jesus himself mentioned. These are, not, these are not mentioned by me. I didn't add these in. And as I give you these different sins, you're going to add a hook to it. You're going to say, God, that's me. I need cleansing from this because it's spewing out of me. Some people who are like pressure cookers keep everything stuffed, but it's not yet spewed out, but it's eating you up. 
And God is saying, I want to deliver you today. I want to cleanse you so that you will be a magnet for me in the nations so that when you speak, the words go out with authority and power and don't fall to the ground so that when you pray for people genuinely with a heart of love, things change in their life so that you will walk in favor, so that you will actually experience signs, wonders and miracles. But if you are going to be so fake, if you're going to be so pent up with all of this rage when the outside is just looking all bright and shiny, I can't do much with you. That is a broken vessel. God wants to cleanse us today. So as I read this, can you just attach yourself to one and say, God, that's me. Could be multiple ones. That's okay. You don't need to do this publicly before people. You can do it privately with your Savior. And I believe our Redeemer is going to turn things around. God cleanse us of these deep sins in all our lives. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. Father, we just bring these to you, even as we have tagged our name to a couple of these. We lift our hands and hearts to you, God. Will you forgive us? We repent of every unrighteousness. Repent of every sin by commission and omission. We repent for the things we have done out of ignorance. We are repenting for the things we did with full knowledge. Forgive us, God. Turn us around. Change the direction that we are headed in. Heal our hearts. Heal our minds. Heal our bodies. God, we pray that we will be good trees that bear good fruit. We pray, O oh God, that you will work deep inside us so that generations will be changed. Help us. Hold us. Heal us, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we get into this week, I want you to take this with joy. This It may have been a heavy sermon, but we need to take this into the world that I'm healed so that I can bring God's healing to others, not so that we would get the glory or the praise, so that He would be glorified, so He would be honored because our God is mighty. He is on the move on the earth right now and He wants to start with us, His body. So as we allow God to work in us, exchange your hypocrisy for God's righteousness. Exchange the, the whole duality for just being one heart, one mind, one soul, worshipping Him. We need to unite the broken parts of our lives and bring it all before God. And I pray that as we do this, it's a lifelong process, that we would keep remembering that He doesn't dismiss the hypocrites. He gives us grace, that we would keep coming back. Every time you sense that hypocrisy, you would come back to God and say, I'm sorry, forgive me. And you would resist the temptation to fall into it again and again. God bless you. Have an amazing week. So church, even as we listen to God's word, I believe God's calling us to live the kingdom life right here on this earth in 2024. And I pray that every step that you take, every person that you meet, that you will have his words right in your mouth that will be coming out. I pray that you'll be able to meditate on his word every day so that you'll be equipped You'll rely on the Holy Spirit every day. So you'll know what He's asking you to do. Your spiritual ears will be open. Your spiritual eyes will be open to know what and where you're warring right now. So that He'll be able to tell you, this is what I want you to do. I pray that as you step out, you'll have His grace, His strength. Remember, His grace is sufficient for us here on this earth. But we need to ask for it every day. Be reminded that He's given us grace to live well here on this earth. Be strengthened. If you're coming to Chennai, do reach out to us. We would love to host you. We would love to uh, have you as part of the different things that we do here in church. We have a lot of Bible plans that are published on the Version Bible app. So I would request you to follow us on Version. So if you just go there and click on Discover, search for We Are Zion, our profile will be right there. Follow us. You will be notified every time we publish a new Bible plan. And even as we enter into the remainder of this year, we are praying for God to do great and mighty things in and through our lives. So I would ask for you to have that kind of expectation. He's not done with us yet in 2024. There are greater things to be done. Let's testify. Let's witness. Let's be dependent. And let's fulfill the call of God on our lives. I pray that you have a blessed week. And remember that whoever finds Jesus finds life. God bless you.